In my best field watches roundup, I mentioned an up and coming brand called Bertucci. Now don't let the name fool you. They're not one of these Kickstarter Italianized brands like Filippo Scametti or Valucci or whatever. No, this American company stands out from the crowd. I mean, just look at them. Their super chunky lugs almost look like the shoulders of that giant soldier from the movie Troy. So they may not be the most elegant of timepieces, but they're not meant to be, are they? Bertucci seems to be laser focused on durable field watches. And when you prioritize function, form often plays second fiddle. Over the years, I've covered some real bargains in this category. But how do these oddballs compare? Is there any incentive to pick them over well-known options like the Timex Weekender or the bargain Loris field watches? Well, thanks to Amazon for covering the cost of two of these, I've actually got them here to test. Let's delve into the details together. So both arrived in identical cardboard packaging. This is rudimentary to say the least, but considering that these watches typically cost between $30 and $60, it's to be expected. And rather than cut costs on packaging than the watch itself. I mean, they're meant to be durable anyway, so it'd be pretty embarrassing if they couldn't survive knocks during shipping, wouldn't it? The two I have here look similar on the surface, but they're actually quite different from one another. The smaller option is the A1S. The S standing for steel, which is what the case is constructed of. Funnily enough, the Batucci website doesn't specify what grade of stainless steel this is. I emailed them to check. They confirmed it is indeed 316L, which is the industry standard stuff. This is more durable than the chromed brass used in most Timex field watches that typically retail in the same range as these Batucci's. This steel model comes in with a compact 35.9mm diameter, a 10.8mm thickness, and a 44.9mm lug to lug length meaning it's particularly viable for smaller arms. Though those super chunky lugs do give it some more wrist presence. You can also get virtually identical options to this in 30, 40, and 45 millimeter sizes, that's the one. I'll link as many of them as I can find in the video description to give you the most options. Admittedly, the naming scheme is a bit overwhelming, but it's brilliant to have such a range of options nonetheless. All of you watching will likely be able to find a Batucci that fits you. Not only do they have multiple sizes, but they also stock a wide range of materials too, including anodized aluminium, or aluminum, which is right, and reinforced polycarbonate. The larger, more expensive A2T I have here is constructed of titanium, a Ben's Watch Club favorite, I must admit. Titanium is a great choice for budget field watches due to its lightweight yet durable performance. Typically, the trade-off is inferior case finishing, as titanium, especially when coated, is just harder to work with than steel. However, these issues are usually averted when the brand uses simplistic matte finishing methods like the sandblasting used here. Interestingly though, Batucci actually offers four different finishes on their titanium watches, depending on the model you purchase. Now, I can't speak to the execution of the high polish models. Still, I'd be tempted to stick with one of the three matte versions, as the glossy ones look like cheaper chromed brass in online videos. Scratches on such a reflective surface will surely be more pronounced, especially given the fact that Batucci lists it as having no additional coating or plating either. This sandblasting model feels like it has some sort of coating, though it isn't specified on the Batucci website. Remarkably, the surface feels more resilient than the titanium used in the usually far pricier Casio Lineage watch I own, which itself has accrued a number of scratches over the years. The A1S steel watch has a more typical brushed finish, which again looks decent enough, though I can't say it'll be winning any awards. While the flank Thanks, bezel and rear are all very well cut. Both models have obvious imperfections in the area between the looks. These aren't noticeable unless you're looking for them as the case often shades them, but they are a tad unsightly and reveal that these are indeed budget watches, or at least they're meant to be. Something that initially confused me was the angled cutout on the steel watch. Now, obviously cutouts are normally there to aid the functionality of a pass-through strap. I mean, that's a given. Still, I thought the angle looked a bit off compared to normal. A shallower angle would certainly look more streamlined when the strap is fitted. Maybe that remains true, but when fiddling with the strap, I realized that this taller cutout enables far easier strap changes, especially when considering the sewn-in keepers towards the end of the band. These may otherwise not fit through the gap at all. You've probably already glimpsed one of Batucci's hallmarks by now too, that being the solid, immovable bars between the looks. These are both good and bad. They're good in the sense that they remove a common point of failure, the spring bars, but as a result of that, you are limited to pass-through straps, just like the Zulu-style bands that these watches come fitted with as stock. In all honesty, these default options are decent enough for most people. Just don't bank on switching out for a two-piece to reduce the overall thickness because you can't. With the stock strap, the effective thickness is boosted to 12.5 millimeters for the A1S and 13 mil for the A2T, so they are quite chunky. One reason they're this deep is that the bezels are raised above the crystals, providing added protection from side-on impacts. Glancing blows are probably the most common way damage occurs with wristwatches. 
which this design will help mitigate. It's unlikely you'll smash your watch in a square on impact. If that type of impact did occur against the flat surface, the raised bezel would again save the crystal. Still, if a sharp object did surpass the bezel, the mineral crystal fitted to both models would just scratch as easily as with any other watch. In my recent scratch tests, I found the mineral is far more susceptible than sapphire. If you're paying under $100 for these, then that's to be expected, it's the norm, but sapphire is often the expected material at higher price points. Unlike the movement field I reviewed not too long ago, both of these have grippy screw down crowns that combined with the substantial screwed rears, solidify the water resistance ratings of 100 meters and 200 meters respectively. I'd have no fear submerging either of these for extended durations if required. They both really feel like they'll do the job. The rears themselves harbor militarized engravings, including specifics about each model. One particularly useful inscription that I want to point out is that each movement's battery type is listed there too. So you don't have to waste time disassembling and then reassembling the watch to discover what cell you need to buy when it dies. It's just really handy. I wish more watch brands would do this. Something I'd also like to see in the future from Bertucci is a solar field watch which would remove the need for battery changes altogether. I think that functionality just really suits the whole thing that this brand is targeting anyway. Low light performance is decent and the pips at the circumference seem to last particularly well, so either model should perform when camping or on other nightly escapades. Bertucci does have some models with tritium tubes should you want longer lasting performance at the expense of initial brightness. That substance works quite well if you like to use night vision goggles for whatever reason. The A1S contains a basic Miyota quartz movement. It's unmarked, but I believe it's the same Miyota 2315 that featured in my Sterling review. Again, this really is a cheap movement that works and is accurate enough, but it's nothing special. Don't expect good second-hand alignment with these, as the 2315 tends to have an inconsistent motion that doesn't always line up perfectly with the markers. It's a little bit all over the place. As you can see from the battle scars and the case bag, I was defeated by the rear on the titanium model. I tried three different tools and it just wouldn't budge no matter what I tried. I'd hazard a guess it's another similar Miyota, but don't quote me on that. Visually, both are very similar, and in a surprise to no one, they both look like field watches. Both dials have the stereotypical bold outer numbers and a compact inner 24-hour ring that you'll find on most other options, though the font choice and proportions are a little different than most other watches. The loom pips here are quite small, and the hour numbers are positioned pretty close to the outside. Other than the dots, everything here is printed onto the surface, giving a simple, utilitarian result whose legibility exceeds its quality. Uniqueness comes in the form of the second hand, which has a spade handle-like counterbalance that's subtle but cleverly executed. It's easy to see, but it isn't too in your face. Overall, these are functional watches that could be ideal if you're looking for something that delivers rugged looks and performance. They've got some clever touches that do set them apart from more generic field watches that are normally pretty hard to discern from one another. Unfortunately, these Batucci watches have one huge problem. Price. In the UK, these have recently been shooting up in price to the extent that they're now selling for double what they were a few months ago. Whether this is due to limited availability because of shipping problems, it's unclear. I doubt it's due to insane Christmas demand or anything like that as Bertucci doesn't have a significant presence here in the UK. And these price jumps started well before the typical festive rush. You can check the description links to check current pricing in your region. For over 120 and 170 quid a pop at the time of recording, these entry-level watches simply aren't worth buying as of late 2022, despite the high review scores on Amazon. I'd certainly wait a few weeks or months and see if prices return to pre-inflated levels. Or maybe that's it, maybe it's just inflation. But yeah, currently you can get a variety of other options that are available for similar prices or less outside of the US. Some viable alternatives are part of the Timex Expedition North range. Those all boast the Sapphire Crystal and some other great features. You can check out my review of those on screen now. They're like the best watches Timex has made in ages. Though they're still more expensive than a weekender.